I want you to listen this morning to begin with the words to a theme song of a once very popular TV show. And we'll see if you can recognize what show this is from. But here are the words. Making your way in the world today takes everything you've got. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you like to get away? Sometimes you just want to go where everybody knows your name. And they're always glad that you came. You want to be where you can see that our troubles are all the same. You want to be where everybody knows your name. How many of you recognize the words that need them? Our most studies. From the once popular TV show called Cheers. And the reason why I, I read those words to you this morning is because those words simply show within each and every human being a very deep and longing desire. And that desire is just simply to belong, to be accepted, to be part of a community. And when I say community, what I'm talking about is a community where people care about each other. Where people accept each other despite of their failings, despite of their faults. Where people share an emotional bond. Where people are committed to one another. And if you think about those words, it sounds very much like the community of God, or at least the community that God intended. And that community we call the church. How many of us today would love to belong to a group where people are glad when you showed up? Where people were glad and supported you and stood by you in tough times? Where people accepted you instead of criticizing and judging you. That's what God intended for the community. His community. His church. You know, it's a sad thing when you think about people looking for an accepting, a loving, or a very supportive place. And they find it most often in, say, like support groups, whether it's something like AA or whether it's in a Greek support group or, or something like that. Or they might even find that community more in a bar than in sometimes they do in a church. It, it's a sad thing that when people look to those kind of places for that model community, that the Lord intended to be his church. At the end of World War I, Herbert Hoover, of course, who would eventually become one of our presidents, he led the Allied relief efforts after that war to try to put the pieces, to put things back together in those communities, in those <coughs> areas that had been so devastated by the war. And one of those places in Finland they actually developed a new word or coined a new word, and that word was Hoover. And what that word meant was someone who was helpful, someone who was caring. That person is a real Hoover, is what they would say. This morning I would just ask, if someone coined a word from your name, what would it be? Would it signify a loving, careful, helpful, cheerful person, or would it mean something totally, completely different? If you'll turn in your Bibles this morning to the third chapter of Colossians, I want to begin reading in the 12th verse there. And I want us to be reminded this morning really what the community of God is all about. And what are the characteristics, what are the traits that the people who are part of the community of God, what are those traits that they exhibit or that they should exhibit? But look here in the third chapter of Colossians, beginning of verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, 
and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues, put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So what does this passage tell us this morning? What does it say about the people that are part of the community of God? Well, if you look very beginning, right there in verse 12, what I call our spiritual character wardrobe, what it should be. It says right here in verse 12, it says to put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now, I don't know if those particular traits or characteristics sound kind of familiar to you from another passage in God's Word. But in Galatians chapter 5, we read this where it says the fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. And then it says, against such things as these, there is no law. You see, there is no need to be any regulating of compassion or kindness or humility or gentleness or patience or love or forgiveness. There doesn't need to be any limitations put on these traits, these characteristics, by us specifically as believers and followers of Jesus Christ. But many times we as prideful, selfish, sinful human beings, we continue to limit those genuine expressions of those traits or what is called the fruit of that should be produced out of our lives as the result of the presence of the Holy Spirit within us. Why is it so important that we exhibit these traits? Well, again, it tells us right there in verse 12. It says, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. You know, at the point where you gave your heart and life to Jesus Christ, you didn't choose God. He had already chosen you. He chose you to be a holy people. Holy meaning completely different, completely changed from an ordinary, normal person that you would see in this world that is still controlled by a life of sin. And we are God's chosen people, holy, and we are dearly loved. Well, who are we dearly loved by? We're dearly loved by God Himself. And were we deserving of His love? No, absolutely not. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There's a very popular new Christian song that's out today that says this, Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. And then it says, I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Oh, that overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. I couldn't earn it. You couldn't earn it. And I certainly don't deserve it. And you certainly don't deserve it. But look what it says in verse 13. Not only are we to put on the compassion, the kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. But it says in verse 13, bear with each other. Forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. And the Greek literally says this. It says tolerate one another and be gracing. G-R-A-C-I-N-G. Be gracing toward one another. That word tolerate, 
just simply meaning to endure or to overlook the action of something or someone. And grace meaning giving something that someone may not deserve. So we are to bear, we are to tolerate, we are to overlook any actions or any grievances that against someone or something. We are to overlook those. We are to forgive. We are to grace. We are to offer what someone may not deserve from us. But let me say this morning, you can't endure, you can't overlook the action of someone without a heart of forgiveness. You can't extend grace to someone without a heart of forgiveness. It's impossible to put on these traits that we talked about a minute ago, the character, the kindness, the humility, the gentleness, the patience. It's impossible to put those on, to clothe ourselves with those without a heart of forgiveness. Now I know I understand and I've experienced myself that many times forgiveness may seem impossible. It may seem next to impossible. But if you remember the words of Jesus, he was asked one time, Dear Lord, how many times are we to forgive? And, and Peter asked Jesus this question. And Peter thought he was being very lenient when he says, Do we forgive up to seven times? <laughs> Jesus just threw him for a loop. And his response when Jesus says, No, I say forgive 70 times 7. What Jesus is meaning there, you go above and beyond. You go way above what's expected. When it comes to compassion and humility and gentleness and, and patience and kindness and love and forgiveness, you go above and beyond what is expected is what Jesus says. And Jesus certainly went way above and beyond what our expectations when he literally gave his life on the cross for us. And it was a very cruel, inhumane, torturous death that he endured for us. And then look what it says in verse 14. It says, over all of these that we just talked about, over all of these virtues, these characteristics, these traits, it says, put on love. We looked last week, actually looked Wednesday night a week ago, and also last Sunday. We talked about one particular passage from Romans 13, verse 8, which says this, Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. And you know the Greek word for that word another? It is heteros, which means different. It doesn't mean love somebody who's like you or love somebody that agrees with you or that thinks the same way that you do or dresses the same way that you do or whatever. It means you love somebody, another, who may be totally, completely different than you. Whether it's looks, whether it's dress, whether it's personality, whether it's character, whether they're a person of love or whether they're a person you might consider a person of hate or bitterness or anger. We are to love others that are different, not like us. I'm so thankful that Jesus didn't love people who were like him because he wouldn't have found very many people to love. He loved people who were completely, totally different than him. Us, people who were wretched, poor, and blind, and sinful. And so what does Scripture say about that opposite of love? <clears throat> you know, if you want to be obedient to God's commandments, if you want to satisfy the law, because that's what this verse says in Romans 13, says, there, Except the continuing debt to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. And what's that saying? If you want to obey God and be obedient to His Word and obedient to your, His law, it has to first start with love. And what does Jesus say about the opposite of love? He says this in 1 John 3. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. So the community of God. And this is the first point on your notes this morning if you're following along with him. 
The community of God is people whose spiritual wardrobe is compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. And all of these encompass in love and forgiveness. And Kevin, you might need to leave that up for a few minutes so people can make sure they get it all. So the next thing here, verse 15. What is our spiritual obligation? When it comes to all of this, look what it says in verse 15 there. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Now we're not talking about a peace where they're just absent of conflict. Because if you're waiting for that kind of peace and only that kind of peace, you'll never know peace. We're always going to be suffering. We're always going to be going through some kind of trial. We're always going to be going through some kind of trouble. Sometimes in life they're fewer than at other times. Sometimes it's always, I mean, there's always going to be some kind of conflict. But that's not the peace we're talking about. We're not talking about the peace that the world understands as peace. We're only talking about the peace that can only come through a trusting, close, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And letting His Word dwell in us richly. I like that word, richly. <laughs> it means you've got a lot of it. It means it's swelling up inside of you. It means you live by it. It means His Word rules in your heart. It controls your life. It controls your attitudes. It controls your emotions. It controls your feelings towards one another. C.S. Lewis said this. I'm looking back up here. The next item, the next point on your notes is this. The community of God is people whose hearts are ruled by the peace of Christ. C.S. Lewis said this. He said, God cannot give us happiness and peace apart from himself because it is not there. There is no such thing as genuine, true happiness and peace apart from Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you may be thinking that your life is just filled with turmoil, it's just filled with struggles, it's filled with disappointment, it's filled with heartache. Maybe this morning you might need to do an examination of your own life personally and look at where you stand in your relationship with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And I look also in verse 15 what it says. Not only are we to be called, not only are we called to be people of peace, but we are called to be people of peace because we are all members of one body. Now, I don't know exactly how many are in this place this morning. We might be at 100 here this morning. But we're not called to be 100 individual different members of this church with our own different goals, with our own different aspirations, with our own different agendas. We're all one body in this place and we're different parts of that one body, but we're all one body. But those different parts all work together in harmony and unison together to accomplish one goal and one purpose and one agenda. And that is to proclaim the message of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what we're ultimately all about. Jesus said in Matthew 12, every kingdom that's divided against itself will be destroyed or will be ruined. And every city or household divided against itself will not stand. You know, if there's one thing that's closed the doors of many churches out there, it's division. And some people refer to those as church splits. And I know... Our own church in the past many, many years ago has gone through a church split. I know of many other churches that have gone through a church split. But of all of those that I think about, the one thing seems to hold true in church splits. There might be one church, one of the churches that's, that's held together, that's surviving. 
But at least the other church, most of the time the other church, whether it's the one that split off or whether it's the church that's been the source of the split, one of those churches usually out of that church split has either died or barely hanging on. A church split is not the way to grow churches. It's not a way to plant new churches. We are members of one body and we are all different parts of that body working together in harmony and unison together for one goal and one purpose. And that's to glorify our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we let the word of Christ, as it says in verse 16, the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Well, what does that mean, the word of Christ? The word of God. Well, 2 Timothy tells us this, that the word of God is this. It is God-breathed. And it is useful for teaching and rebuking. And the Greek word for that word rebuke means to expose. It is good for correcting and training in righteousness. All Scripture is God-breathed. You know what that means? It means that it's alive. It's not just words written on a page that we just read over and we think, hmm, that's pretty good right there. And we close the book and we think nothing more about it. Hebrews tells us this, that the Word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword and it penetrates even to dividing the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow. And then the Word of God also, it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. If the Word of Christ is living and active in us, then the peace of Christ will also rule in us. So here's the next point on your notes. The community of God is people in which the Word of Christ dwells and is living and active. When you spend time, and I hope you do, daily, reading and studying this Word, what does it do for you? Is it truly living and active in your life? Has it truly transformed and changed you into a person of compassion and humility and kindness and patience and gentleness and a person with a heart of love and a person with a heart of forgiveness. That's a word that is living and active. That is a word that is like a double-edged sword that penetrates into your soul and into your spirit. And then look what it says in verse 17 here. It says, whatever you do, whether it's in our word, whether it's in our deeds or in our action, we do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. All that we do, all that we say, whether at work, whether at play, whether at rest, how we interact, how we treat each other, is to be done always understanding that we who proclaim and profess to be Christians, we are identified with Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. If you claim to be a Christian, that's what you're doing. You're saying, I belong to Christ. He is a part of my life. And He has changed my life. He has changed me. I am no longer the person I was before. I was once before. I am now, as 2 Corinthians says, I am now a new creation. I am a new person. And those old habits, those old thoughts, those old desires, those old feelings, those old motivations, all of that is gone. And the new, the new life, the new person in Jesus Christ has come. The last point of your notes is this. The community of God is people in which every saint is always with the understanding that they are identified with Jesus Christ. So if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. 
And then it says this, that all of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through his son, Jesus Christ, and he gave us, as Christians, as followers of Christ, as believers in Christ, he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We're to be reconcilers. We're to be people of compassion and humility and kindness and patience and love and forgiveness. We are to be one body. Individual parts all working together so that body functions efficiently and effectively to the glory and the honor of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. That, this morning, is what the community of God is supposed to look like. Let me pray.